is wonderful power in the blood. And if we don't have blood, we won't be able to breathe, live, or whatever is uh, part of what Jesus wants us to have. He gave us this blood, our body, and he making sure that we are continually to be safe. And now we're going to go to, was that four? 251. Hymnal song 251. A couple of pages. So much for your singing. Now we are getting ready for our mission story. You want me to get it?
got it. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. And I want to give a thanks to El Dorado because he's back, but he's going to let me do some things today so he can observe me. And like I said last week, the boss is around. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're a servant of his, so I appreciate you. And our uh, mission story today is coming from Hubakistan, uh, once again, and, and the title is One Broken String. And we're going to be talking about Artem again, and we're also going to talk about, uh, and this person pronounces his name, Artis. And Artis is a little different. See, at five years old, he was baptized. And guess what? After they baptized him, they never talked to him about God anymore. So you think about it, five years old, he's like, no one spoke to me about God after I got baptized. So he didn't go back to church. And by the time he was 14 years old, he was wearing an earring with a cross in his ear. But his mother she just kind of looked and said, well, he thinks it's cool, you know, and as parents, you kind of overlook things. But then, Artis, he said one day, hey, I want to learn how to play the guitar. And his mother was like, okay, I'm going to take him to the guitar store, and I'm going to let him pick out a guitar. And of course, he picked one out, and he picked out one that had brown electronic guitar. So he picked out a nice, expensive one. And so Mother thought, maybe this will give him a purpose in life if he, you know, gets involved in music and he likes guitar. So he got on what we call YouTube, and he started learning how to play Music. Unfortunately, mm, his music didn't sound like the person and the teacher on the YouTube. So he kept playing his guitar. And what's the worst thing that can happen to your guitar? Artem finally found out. He broke a string. So now his music really wasn't sounding like the music that was being played on YouTube. So he looks, he says, I got to have somebody that's going to help me fix this string on this guitar because I don't know how to do it. So he gets in the telephone and he starts looking up numbers. And this is my telephone book. And believe me, all of you, I got your number. I think everybody's some Steve. <laughs> so he goes calling around. And you know, nowadays, you can get anything off your cell phone. So he wasn't like me. He didn't use that old, old fashioned telephone book. He used his cell phone. So he got a number. And he calls the young man. And he says, Excuse me, I'm looking for someone that can fix the strings on my guitar. So lo and behold, remember last week we talked about Artem. Well, it was Artem that he was calling. And he said, can you help me? So Artem said, yeah, sure, I can help you. So here's my address. So Artem gives Art, Art, gives Artis his telephone and address. So when Artem Art, 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 um, gets there, he says, here's my guitar. He goes, can uh, you help me? He goes, but wait a minute. He goes, this address and name seems to be familiar. So we asked him, hey, is your father named Pasa? And he says, yes, Pasha is my dad. And he says, but he died. He goes, oh, my mother used to work with him making furniture. And, she, and so they became friends. And then the next day, 
Adam placed the guitar string, and afterwards, artists, he began to play again. And oh boy, do you think the music was so bad that Artem said, hey, stop that, stop right now. That's what people do to my singing. And so he says, no, that's not sounding right. You are playing your guitar the wrong way, out of order. Mm -mm. So Artis, he said, wait a minute, maybe that's why my music don't sound like the music that's coming off YouTube. So once he began to play, Artem asked him, would you like to take lessons? So he gave him the first lesson. And then he noticed Artis had a earring in his ear and it was a cross. So Art Artem, he asked him, are you a Christian? He said, mm-mm. I'm, I'm not a Christian, no. So on the second lesson, the next time, Artem asked him, hey, let's meet next time at a room located in the Seventh-day Adventist church. The church is closed, and they don't mind, you know, you coming, and they know I'm going to give you some lessons. And guess what? It was close to Artem's home, so he agreed, yeah, I'll come. So he kept playing the guitar, spending more time on lessons, and then he found out that Artem, outside lessons, he began to learn about him. He was a global missionary pioneer. And he says, what's a missionary? And he says that, and then he explains to him, it's a person who shares the gospel with people in their own culture. So he asked him, said, would you like to go on a hiking trip with some of us Seventh-day Adventists? So they went to the mountains and they went hiking and Artis, he enjoyed it. He listened to the songs and guess what? They let him play the guitar right along with Artem. And so that summer, the seven day Adventist retreat was in another city and he was caught off guard when he went. But then the guest speaker said, I want all the attendees to get with a partner and I want you to pray. Now, as adults, this next one kind of hits home. So, quote, when someone came to an artist to pray with him, he says, I'm an atheist. So that person went away. See how easy it was for that Adventist to walk away? So then the next person came and said, artist, would you like to pray? He said, oh, no, mm -mm. quote, moreover, he added, I never prayed before. Guess what that particular Adventist youth did? He said, hmm, well, we can fix that. So he taught artists how to pray. And that night, artists, for a long time, he thought about that. What had taken place? Someone did not walk away from him, but taught him how to pray. Quote, I was baptized when I was five, he said. Why do Adventists baptize adults? He couldn't understand that. So then his Adventist friends explained to him. He learned that the Adventists understood, understood the Bible to teach people they should be old enough to understand the Bible in the commitment that they are making to God before being baptized. Notice that, a commitment before being baptized, and you have to understand the Bible. The next Sabbath, Artis went on to Adventist church near his home. He worshiped for the first time. And then in the afternoon, he joined the church members in and passing out school supplies to the needy community and children. So he felt really good about that in his heart, and he thought, quote, what is the point of living if you don't help others? So in, as it turned out in his life, he no longer wanted to live an aimless existence. Eight months had passed, and then he started attending church regularly. He began Bible studies and he wanted to give his heart to Jesus in baptism. Quote, he is glad that his guitar string broke 
And his quote is, I believe in God because of a broken guitar string. So, you know, sometimes when we walk away from people, God puts them in our path that we won't walk away. And we thank God that we had one Adventist that when he said, uh, moreover, I, I never prayed, he stayed there. He wouldn't walk away. So I thank you for listening to the mission story. And uh, I think from the mission story, Elder, do we do music or do we go straight into uh, Sabbath school? Okay. All right. Okay. Just a second. <laughs> Now, just like last week, I'm going to get some participants this week. Okay? So if I give you a card, hold on to it, and I'll let you know when I need your help. And before we begin, we're going to bow our heads and say a prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we give you thanks and praises for the breath of life. We give you thanks and praises that you gave us six days to do your work and to study our lesson. So, Lord, we're not teaching today. We're just hitting on the points. And, Lord, as we know that time is valuable, Lord, we may not hit on every single point, but, Lord, we know that each and every one of us, even those that are streaming in, has studied the word. So, Lord, grant us your wisdom, your understanding, and your knowledge through the Holy Spirit. Remove me and let you work and do your work to further your children in your gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, Steve, I need your help for a minute. Okay, Steve is my helper today. <laughs> and what, as we turn to our Sabbath school lesson, what is the title of lesson two in our Sabbath school book? The central. Mm hmm. Okay. I'm going to move some things real quick. And on the count of three, I want everyone to read the, uh, your memory verse. On the count of three. One, two, three. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteousness right hand, Isaiah 4, 10. Now, I'm going to pass some pictures around. And guess what? I want you to circulate them through because I am giving you some pictures of some goats. And some I took at the zoo. Years ago, I took pictures of the goats at the zoo. Mm-hmm, in St. Louis, okay? And I want you to see all, I want you to keep passing those and will you pass them to Paula? Yes, we have goats that I took pictures of and then I found some goats in the magazine and by now you're saying, well, what is she talking about, goats? Well, on the Sabbath school time, it tells you that pretend, and you know what? We often as adults, we often think only kids pretend. So we're going to pretend this morning. I'm going to pretend that you are herdsmen and you're out there with your goats and you're out there in the vineyard and you're at Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and you're looking down, but you got your goats with you. And guess what? You hear a voice and you recognize that it's Jesus. And guess what? It says that, you know, Jesus empathetically states something to you. Assuredly, 
I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, I couldn't find a stone today, so I have a, I have a rock, okay, to represent my stone. Now, guess what? If you didn't understand what God was saying, neither did the disciples. They didn't understand that. Even as God said it, they didn't understand it. And guess what? There's some questions that we had to ask ourselves today. And the first question it says, the disciples are confused, and are you? What would Jesus possibly mean by those words? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. The another question we asked ourselves, how do they relate to the end time world that Jesus' disciples asked about? Well, as you know, Jesus is good at blending things. He's the, he's the creator. So he blends events with leading others to, the, and he talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to look at this picture. It's supposed to represent destruction. Now, in our time, we see Ukraine as being destructive. Think about Jerusalem back in that day. If you saw Jerusalem being destructive, being torn down, and all sorts of de demolishment, you would be like, oh, what's going on, Jesus? And we too today, as we learn in the Bible, in the biblical days, there was destruction in Jerusalem. So as we go on and we go through the last part of the Sabbath school lesson, it tells us we should have read uh, Matthew 24. It outlines the last day's events that is going to be Jerusalem's fall. So we study, we will study Satan's twofold strategy, both to deceive and destroy God's people. Just like in the Garden of Eve, Satan was trying to destroy, he is still in the process of deceiving and destroying. What the e evil one fails to accomplish through persecution, he hopes to achieve through compromise. God is never caught by a surprise. Even the most challenging times, he preserves his people. Now, as we know, when we move to Sunday's lesson, it says a broken-hearted Savior. A broken-hearted Savior. So I'm going to use Steve for a moment. <laughs> Steve said, I'm not going to get sound. I want Steve to give all of you a heart, and I want you to hold on to it until the end of the Sabbath school lesson. Okay, and I, my heart says, love and care for each other, okay? You know, just to summarize some things on Monday's lesson. See, Jesus is sitting at Mount Olive, and he's looking down. Then John, in John's gospel says, he came to his own, and they knew not, they, I'm sorry, his own, and they did not receive him. You know, you as parents, you love your children. And when one goes astray, there are times when you spend on your knees praying and you ask God to bring them back. What do you think our Lord has done? On that cross, he gave his blood, his life, to make sure we understood the love he has for us. So a broken-hearted Savior you think about it, Jesus did everything he could do to save his people from the coming destruction and their beloved city. The destruction that would make Jerusalem look just like the destructions that we see today in Ukraine. But in the Bible's days, Jerusalem was the place of worship. This is what God is telling his people. It says Jesus loves his people 
flow, Jesus' love for his people flowed from heart of his infinite love. He repeatedly appealed to them to love in love for repentance and accepting his gracious invitation of mercy. Where would we be without God's mercy? And he's, he's, he's given it to us freely if we only receive it. So as we read that question, and it refers to Luke 19, 41 through 44, Matthew 23, 37 through 38, and John 5 through 40, what do these verses tell us about Jesus' attitude toward his people and their response to his loving invitation of grace and mercy? And what revelations of God's character do you see? Well, we as people, it was difficult to understand these events of destruction in Jerusalem. Because, see, we see God's loving character. But God didn't want that destruction. Who did? The devil. Because, see, history repeats that 10,000 people died and by the Roman general uh, Titus. Now, think about Jerusalem. If that many people died in Jerusalem, let's bring it to our, our, our time. How many people do we see dying each day in war and all kind of uh, situations that God's heart has to be broke, but he has to allow us to see what destruction looks like. We, in our, I think in our day and time, we would have never thought Ukraine would have just lost that many people from just one man wanting land, wanting something that doesn't belong to him. And our next question says, where was God when his people suffered so greatly? You have young people that are asking that question. Uh, good morning, Elder Scott. Did you, get, did you get something from Steve? He's passing out a card. Oh, okay, I'll make sure you get one. Okay, because we're on Sunday's lesson, and I'm just summarizing it, okay? And then it goes on to say that he reached out of, to his people by their rebellious, rebellion against his loving kindness. They forfeited the divine protection. See, you can't live in sin and keep doing sin and want God to bless you. See, if I come up to you and I take something from you and it doesn't belong to you, and then I say, God, I want you to bless me because I stole her purse and her purse got $500 in it and I know you blessed me because I needed some money. It doesn't work like that. And it did not work back like, like that in God's times. So he allows consequences. Now, as parents, we tell our kids, this is the rules of the house. You are supposed to do this, this, and this. And when you don't, there's consequences. Except I had a mom and dad that forgot, especially my mom. She forgot to read Ellen White on discipline. Because my mom's first thought was, give me a switch, give me a belt, and I've only said it one time. Now you think about it in your life. If God told you something one time and you didn't do it, Oh, yes, there's consequences, but you know he still loves you because you go through those trials and tribulations because you didn't make the right decision, and God gave you enough wisdom in the Holy Bible to follow his, 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 his way of living, his way of doing things. He's your example. And then you say, well, you know, maybe I'll just do it my way. And I'm not going to pick on the teenagers because, believe me, I was a teenager. Believe me. And you know, even sometimes as adults, we have husbands and wives, hmm. and the wife will tell the husband, honey, I don't think you should do it that way, and the husband, but honey, have I always done it that way? And then when the husband find out, man, I wish I had did it the way my wife said. And, and then they get this look, and the wives say, oh, that's okay, honey, you can still go back and redo it. That's love because they accept that you didn't want to listen. That's love from God. He accepts that if he hadn't went to the cross, none of us would be here. So he accepted that we are imperfect people, 
but he doesn't expect for us to stay that way. He tells us to repent and accept his mercy and his love. And as we get down to, oh, I'm sorry, are you Rachel? Bless you. Did Steve has a card for you? Okay. So when it says, at, and, and I'm at the, uh, a little paragraph right before the next question, Satan delights in war. Oh, we know what happens in war, don't we? We saw that the last time. We know what happens in war. We look at war, people die. War, people die. We look at war, it causes people to shoot bullets in other people. And as we look at war, our military is trained to kill. That's what they're trained for in the military, to kill. So it's not unusual to see war, okay? So the question is, in Matthews 24, 15 through 20, what instructions did Jesus give his people to save them from the coming destruction of Jerusalem? He gave them some warnings. He gave them some things to do. But did they do it? Some did. Oh, yes, some did. So, uh, just summarizing Sunday for uh, time purposes, Christian living in Jerusalem in AD 70 and, uh, came from Jewish background. A loving God desired to de preserve his many, many people as possible. And that's why he gave them instructions when the Roman armies approached them to flee the city. There are going to be times, and we're getting to the time of trouble. We're in it, but it's going to get worse. Some of us are going to have to flee. And when God says flee, he don't mean, wait a minute, let me pack my bag. I need to pack this, and I need to make sure I got this. Oh, no. When God says go, you're going to go with whatever's on your back. Okay? So at the bottom, just a, re a reflecting question for you. Who do, who, I'm sorry, we do not judge God's character by events we see around us. We filter all the events we see through the um, premises of his loving character, and it is revealed in the Bible. If you are not studying your Bible, you will see, and some of you have probably got, been around some people and you heard, God letting all this uh, go wrong. I don't know why them Christians keep talking about God. Look at all this stuff that's going wrong. But it says, why is it that we should look for good counsel? When we read the Bible, that's the good counsel. Okay, Monday's lesson real quick. Did, any, did we give anybody Monday? Does anybody have a Monday and have an A? Okay, so I want you to, you got Monday and you got an A. The title is Christians Provid I'm sorry, Providential Pro Providentially Preserved. Okay, would you read that first paragraph that starts God's mercy? And wait a minute, I think you're going to need a mic. Ah, and I'm a little slow. That's why I was, I, 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 I kind of going to get there. <laughs> okay. It says... God's mercy, grace, providence, and foreknowledge are clearly revealed in the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem. Celestius, Gaius, and the Roman army surrounded the city in an unexpected move. When their attack seemed, seemed imminent, they withdrew. The Jewish army pursued them and won a great victory. With so now we see that they were going to attack. But remember, God always goes before. So see, as they thought, oh, we're just going to beat these little Jews down to the, a pole. It didn't happen. Christians in Jerusalem fled to Palea and Perea beyond the Jordan River. 
the promised sign had been given to them, the waiting Christians. And now there was an opportunity that was offered to all who would obey the Savior's warning. Events were so overruled that the Romans, they hindered the fight against the Christians. Let me let you know that you don't always have to open your mouth and de defend yourself and try to fight. If you are a Christian, God will fight your battles. When things are, when you see people throwing darts or shooting, and I always say shoot bullets at you and you don't know where they're coming from, you just stop and say, Jesus. Because there's some things you can't fight against, especially Satan, because you can't see that spirit. But God says, if you want my help, read your Bible, because it is written. See, Jesus overcame. So he tells us we can overcome. In Psalms 46.1 and Isaiah 41.10, what do these passages tell us about God's provisional, am I saying it right now, Call, uh, care? Providential care. Okay, who has Monday C? Okay, I'm going to get back there. Here I come. <laughs> Wait a minute. Here I come. Okay. Okay, she's going to start at God is sovereign. God is sovereign and under an overruled event on the earth of the ultimate accomplishment of his divine purposes. Although at times God alter, alters his original plan based on our human choices ultimate plan for the planet will be fulfilled. There will be times when the people of God experience hardship, prosecution, imprisonment, and death itself for the cause of Christ. But even in the most challenging of times, with Satan's most vicious attack, God sustains and preserves his church. So see, we can't get comfortable because we are God's children and say, oh, those things should happen to those that don't believe. I'm a child of God. And do we nowadays sometimes, because we have the last message, do some of us get a little cocky with that? Well, they don't know the truth, and we do. Some of us feel like since we know the truth, we're not going to go and share it. I know it, and they need to find out how to get it. That's not God's way. But God is letting us know you are not exempt from some of the things. And thank you, Sister Paula. You are not exempt from hardship, persecution, imprisonment, and death. So in Hebrews 11, 35 through 38, and Revelation 2, through 10, and, Revelation 2 and 10, what realities do these texts reveal about our battle with the forces of evil? Hmm. How do these passages harmonize with the idea of God's protection in the previous question? Is there a contradicting contradiction in the idea of God's protection and God allowing us to face painful suffering, even in martyrs of death for the cause of Christ? Um, Brother Steve, we have the Sister Sandy that came in. Good morning. So, you see, we're not exempt. Oh, okay. You got it. Okay. So, uh, Sister Sandy, we're on Monday, and we're getting ready to finish that up. So, it's just letting us know that if Christ suffered, his children in biblical times suffered for his name's sake, we're going to suffer for God's name's sake. And if you think, that by you saying, I, I, I keep the Sabbath, that's not going to save you. Because God tells us in his word, there's going to be people coming in at that 11th hour. And guess what? They won't know all the stuff that we have the opportunity to learn now and to share. So as we continue, it says, in vain, Satan's effort to destroy the church of God by violent Oh, he's very violent because if we look at the destruction, and once again, this is just the illustration of destruction, and I want you to use your imagination that wonder if this was Jerusalem, but we look at Ukraine and some of the other countries that are warring. 
The destruction is everywhere. You're not going to be able to run from it. You may deny it, but you're not going to be able to run from it. So, as we continue with the great controversy, now everybody, Elder Renardo, while you were away for, for a little bit, I passed out books for the great controversy, and I gave them the glasses so they could see the eclipse. So, we know about the great controversy. There are many. This is their first time ever hearing about it. So, we, as, as following Jesus, we yield our lives to Jesus. And it says, did, they, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus yielded their, up their lives. They did not cease from their faithful standard bearing, fell at their post. By defeat, they conquered. God's worksmen were, were slay. And we look at some of the Bible characters. Can you imagine like John the Baptist, your head being cut off? But yet you still praise God. Can we imagine being in a situation like Job, especially as parents, grandparents? You lose all your children. And yet he stayed faithful. He talked to God. He understood that God give life and God has a, a right to take it. So as we look at that bottom, what should it mean to us that the Bible writers who certainly knew pain and suffering could nevertheless again and again write about the reality of God's love? How can we experience that same love for ourselves? I think we have the purpose in my, our hearts that we're going to follow God even until the end. So as we move to Tuesday's lesson, Faithful Aims Persecution. Okay, real quick, as we go through uh, really quick, it says throughout centuries that the Christian church, through, uh, Satan always attacked, but yet the church grew and it continued to grow. So we have to look at that. Satan is not going to stop. He's going to continue. Okay, because he is out to destroy, to kill God's children. Now, if you're not part of God's children, he's not going to bother you. <laughs> okay, so imprisonment, torment, and persecution. Faithful believers totally committed to Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, proclaimed his word with power. Lives were changed and 10,000 were converted. You know, we, we don't live in other countries, but think about, this is the Sabbath. How many other countries are baptizing thousands of people that we don't know anything about? That's why it's so important with our mission statements, we keep our mission stories, we keep up with what's going on all over the world because here in the United States, we're baptizing too, but there are millions being baptized, okay? So, and, and good morning to the ladies that came in, and we're on Tuesday's lesson, okay? And it says in Acts 2, 41, and Acts 4, 4, and 31, Acts 5, 42, and Acts 8, 1 through 8. What do these verses teach us about the challenges the New Testament church faced and also why it grew so rapidly? We go on to understand that even the disciples faced threats, imprisonment, persecution, and death. So we're not immune to that, but we do know that the power of the Holy Spirit, it encourages us to proclaim, and we proclaim the resurrection of Christ. Churches multiplied through Judah, uh, Galilee, and Samaria. But they didn't stop there. Even though Satan tried to tact, the shackles for Satan was broken. Even some of the pagan superstitions before the power of the resurrection of Christ, Satan was still using people to do his dirty work. And his dirty work is to destroy and kill anything that's going to be close or going to be called God's children. So, when we look at that, 
we see that the gospel triumphed in the face of overwhelming odds. Do you know there are people in this world in the year 2024, if they get caught with a Bible in some countries, they kill them. And you have certain countries that don't want anything brought in that deals with the Bible and Jesus. And you know, I often wonder, you know, when God says the word will not go back void, those people are reaching out in social media. Some of them probably are in what we say maybe in buildings below that have been destructed, trying to reach out to learn about the word of God, even through all of the torment that they're going through. So I have someone that has Tuesday, and they have a D on their card. Anybody have Tuesday with a D? Might be Cliff, okay. He's back there, all righty. And so as that person gets ready to read, we know that the gospel penetrates, it motivates the corners of the earth. It, it will not die because God said it. My word will not come back void. And we can believe anything in the Bible. Okay, you got it? Okay. Okay, we're reading. Uh, your paragraph starts, instead, instead, faith filled the disciples' hearts. disciples' hearts, one's gl one glimpse of the resurrected Lord changed their lives. Jesus gave them a new reason for living. Our Lord had not only given them the great commission, but the great promise. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Thank you. And as I was saying that the gospel was going all over the earth, and then, although the last disciple, John, died, even the first century others picked up the torch of truth and proclaimed the living Christ. Now, someone has E, right? Okay. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm not going to ask her to... Okay. I want her... Uh, Planes the Younger, governor of the Roman province of Bithynia on the north coast of modern Turkey, wrote to Emperor Trajan around AD 110. Planes' statement is significant because it was nearly eight years after the crucifixion. Planes described the official trials he was conducting to find and execute Christians. He stated, for many persons of all ages and classes and of both sexes are being put in peril by accusation, and this will go on. Still continue? Still on? Oh, she can stop. Oh. Okay. I was going to pass some pictures around. And, and there's going to be several pictures coming around. And one is going to be, and it's when I went on vacation where you could get in a jail cell and you could put your head in there and it pretend like you was in jail. But we know as time is coming, some of us may really be in jail. And as she read, she talked about what this emperor decided to do. He persecuted all ages. So we have pictures of mothers with their babies. Can you imagine an infant? being killed with their mom because he wants them all dead. You don't talk about Jesus. You don't talk about the Bible. And we may even have to go through the hardship of being beaten. 
And how many of us would still be able to praise God when we're being beaten? When we're being, maybe our families are being killed right in front of us. Maybe they're bringing in soldiers. Thank you. They're bringing in soldiers to kill your families and you. You know, it may come a time that when we decide, I'm going all the way to, for God. Violence and war, that's all we're going to see. But we know that God tells us, I am with you even until the end. So once we purpose in our hearts that we're not going to give in, God is going to be with his people. He did not say we were going to be spared from persecution, torment, or anything else. But God is going to be with his people. Okay? So as we read the bottom, it says, despite the devil's most vicious attacks, the Christian church grew rapidly. And our question for us to, to ponder on what can we learn from the early churches that could help us, the end time church? Well, we know one thing, obedience to God's word has to come first. We have to preach the truth and get rid of all the falseness that we hear in the news that we see go around us. Now, this one is for each and every person caring for the community. And once again, I want to say that our community service here at Alton will be opening on April the 21st. So when I saw caring for the community, I knew that God has a purpose for your church here at Alton. Every member, even if you're at home, you can always donate things to the community service, okay? So don't think because you're at home, you're like, Oh, I don't, I don't have anything to do with that community service, but I'm glad that they're, they're feeding the hunger. I'm glad that they're giving them things they need. You have a responsibility too. You may have food right there in your refrigerator and your neighbor, you see them suffering. No food, not even some of the personal items. You know, you think about toothpaste, you think about toilet tissue, you know, you'd be surprised what you can share with someone. So, as we talk about community service, in the early churches it grew not only because its members preached the gospel, but also because they lived the gospel. If I didn't say nothing else for you to remember in uh, Wednesday's lesson, you can't preach something, you can't spread the word of God if you are not living it. What sense would it be for me to tell, and I'm just going to use them for an example, to tell the, uh, the Gonzalez girls, now look, don't you go out there and drink because drinking is not good for your body. And then they see me pull up on the parking lot and see me fall down, and then I come in here and say, <clears throat> and they like, whoa, she's drunk. How can I tell them not to do something if I'm doing it? But instead of preaching to them, maybe I may give them literature on our health message that what does it do to the body when you consume alcohol? What does it do to your body that's not healthy for you? So as we go on, we notice that the believers, they modeled after Jesus. When, uh, and it says, of Christ who went all about in Galilee. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he's healing all kind of sickness. Isn't that what God is asking us to do? To go out and plant a little mustard seed? When we see our brothers and sisters are sick, maybe we can't go to their house, but we can pray. Maybe we can't go to the hospital. Maybe the hospitals are saying we only want family members to come in, but we can pray. And... For heaven's sakes, let us not forget the one thing that we love the most, talking on the phone. You know, some people are like, well, I, you know, I, and you imagine being at a church and no one called you for months and months. No one missed you. Would you think that was a loving church? 
Would you think your brothers and sisters cared about you? Okay. Jesus deeply cared for people. So he did in a New Testament church. In this, he, his unselfish love, commitment to meeting human needs, sharing the good news in the gospel, in the Holy Spirit's power, it impacted the world in the early century of the church, uh, Christian churches. See, many people now, they're not going to listen to you just, well, this is what you should do, and this is what you should not do, and if you do this, you're going to hell, and if you don't, you're going to heaven. They don't want to hear that. Give them something that will cause them to read and study. Because the little mustard seed is only to get them started, get them curious about Christ. So in uh, Acts 2, 41 through 47, in Acts 3, 6 through 9, and Acts 6, 1 through 7, although circumstances vary, what principles can we learn from the passages about authentic Christianity. Okay, one thing we know that the new believers, they did follow Jesus. And then Peter says, anointing with the Holy Spirit, with the powers who went about doing good and healing all who were op uh, oppressed by the devil, for Christ was with him. You know, it is amazing. When you look at the lives of some of the disciples, some of us would have been like, I'm out of here. You know, there was a lot of people that they listened to Jesus. They believed, but when, how you say, times got hard, things wouldn't go in favor. Things wasn't what they expected. Oh, no, they get ready. They get ready to kill him, put him on the cross. I don't know him. Hmm. What about you in these last days? Okay, and it talks about Christ's church, the body. You are the body. The body must work together. But we must have the Holy Spirit that's filling us with God's wisdom, understanding before we go out there and tell somebody else what they're doing or what they should be doing. When God didn't do that, God had a loving spirit about himself. He met them where they were. So sometimes when we get on that pedestal that we, gotta, we think we got to save somebody, we can't save anyone. Only God saves. Okay, do I have someone that has um, Wednesday and has a D on it? Okay, so as she's coming forward, just remember in the great controversy, it's a universal thing. The devil wants to deface the image of God in humans. The purpose of the gospel is to restore the image of God. And restore us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritual healing. Okay, and Sister Barbara's going to take over. The thief does. The thief does, and I come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He longs for us to be physically healthy, mentally alert, emotionally stable, and spiritually whole. Well, thank you, Sister Barbara. So see, God is concerned about our whole being. He just doesn't pick out certain parts that he wants for us. It all must work together. And as we get to the bottom of there, it goes on to say Jesus' own predict prediction in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21 foreseen, foretold the catastrophic ca conditions on the earth. Catas say that again. Catastrophic conditions of the earth. Do we see it now? I mean, you cannot turn on the news without hearing about someone even just simple things. Hit someone and just kept going. Person laying in the middle of the street, police are there. Lawlessness. So God has already said, Jesus sends us out into a broken world as his ambassadors for Jesus. Touch others with his love. That's what Jesus did. 
In the New Testament, Christianity was characterized by Christians' love for one another in their community. You can't separate that. You know, this week, we, I had a new police officer that came and she knocked on the door. She said, well, are we handling your case now from here in Clayton? And she went around and those neighbors that weren't there, she put little cards on their door to let them know if you have any videotape of anybody in the neighborhood that shouldn't have been here on the 18th. And she, I, I like what she said. She said, you know, your neighbors, they want that person or persons caught. She goes, they don't want them in the neighborhood. She goes, and they like you. And see, when the other police officers were like, you need to change your routine. And no doubt about it, police officers have good knowledge from God. But I told them, there's one routine I'm not going to change. I'm going to continue to go to church on the Sabbath, God's Sabbath. I'm not going to change that. God has me. So the question at the bottom says, what role does the church have in cooperating with Christ and providing Satan's charge wrong. I'm sorry, improving Satan's charge wrong. You see, Satan wants everybody to think it is God that's got all this stuff in your world going on. But yet, we know his deceptive methods. Blame someone else and sit back and laugh. That's why it's obvious when we see our Christian brothers and sisters Maybe they are going away from what thus said the Lord. There's no need to criticize them. Pray for them. If they come to you and they need food or something, regardless of what you think, they are still God's children. And you know, I said, I often look at when I see the homeless on the corners and stuff, I always put a dollar in my tracks and then I hand it to them. And I let them know. I said, I'm not seven, I mean, I'm, I'm seven day Adventist. And one, and one gentleman, several of them asked, just Jehovah Witnesses before they take it. I said, no, I'm seven day Adventist. And I mean, and then, you know, it's like, okay. And I think sometimes the way you approach people, they don't want to be looked at down as I'm less than an animal. Because God created them too. And as we go through a, on Thursday, a legacy of love. Now, when we look at John 13, 35 and 1 John 4, 21, what do these verses reveal about Satan's challenge against the government of God in the great controversy? What do they tell us about the is essence of genuine Christianity? We know that Satan will not give up until God opens that sky, and then he will know it is finished. It was finished, really, at the cross because God proved to him, you told everybody I'm not a loving God. I sent my son to save humans, my creation. But how many of us every day thank God for him sending his son? As we look at love, we notice that, and you know I've been on the YouTube with these names. <laughs> when we look at, when we look at on, on, on uh, Thursday, Tertullian, thank you. See, I love having brothers and sisters, <laughs> okay? Notice, his, it says that he was a Christian theology, but he claimed it is mainly the deeds of love so noble that led many to put the brand upon us. See, they say how they love one another. If you think people aren't looking at you and you're calling yourself a Christian, they're looking at everything you do, everything you say, and if your lifestyle doesn't match up, Believe me, if you haven't heard criticism before, you will. Because they will remind you, how can you talk about me? I remember when you did such and such, such and such. And you know, sometimes you have to admit, okay, I did do that sin. I took it to God. But I hope, sister, that you were praying for me when you saw me doing that sin. Because, see, if they got time to concentrate on me, where was their relationship with God? Now see, if you look at your life, you only have time to look at God 
change me that I can be used by the Holy Spirit to share your word on this earth. You don't have time to look at someone else because we all have it in our backgrounds. Okay, does anybody have Thursday and have a B on Thursday? Uh, I knew I'd get it all up. One of the greatest revelations of God's love was demonstrated when two devastating pandemics plagued the early centuries around A.D. 160 and A.D. 260. Christians stepped forward and ministered to the sick and dying. These plagues killed tens of thousands and left entire villages and towns with scarcely an inhabitant. The unselfish, sacrificial, caring, loving ministry of Christians made a huge impact on the po population. Over time, thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands and then millions in the Roman Empire became believers in Jesus during these two epidemics. Love, outgoing concern, and organized selfless care of the sick and dying created an admiration for these believers and the Christ they represented. Amen. Now, you know why it was so important for me to let him read that whole paragraph? Because we know what we just went through with our pandemic. And we were up in the millions of people dying. And yet we still have those wonderful people that we call nurses and doctors. They didn't care about covering up themselves. They did what the minimum they had to do, but their whole purpose was, we're going to give care to these people that need us. You know, it's something when, and I can remember during a pandemic time, when they talked about a nurse and she worked around the clock, there were so many pandemic people coming into that emergency room that by the time she was able to go home, she didn't realize she had contacted it and she died at home. But she never put herself first. She put others. And I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't protect yourself. But you think about the doctor and nurses that lost their lives during the pandemic. But they, weren't not, they were not going to give up on those that were sick. So as we go on, there's a book called The Rise of Christianity. It is a modern historical narr narr narrating portraying the historical events in a new and improved light. His name was Ron, Ron, Rondi, Ronnie Starks. And as we look at that, we learned that most of our Christian brothers and sisters, they have that compassion for others and love. Whether it's feeding them, whether it's giving them clothing. And as we look at, uh, uh, it says, at the, at, the, at the height of the second great pandemic, it was in AD 260, and I, uh, Elder, or do you pronounce that a dynamis? Dionysius. He wrote a lengthy tribute to the historical nursings, nursing efforts of the local Christians, many of whom lost their lives when caring for others. Are you willing to give your life for a brother and sister? Think about that. What would it take for you to give your life for a brother and sister? As we continue, it says, needlessly, the danger that took charge of sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed their lives, they were sincerely happy, for they were infected by others with diseases, drawing them themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pain. So what is, uh, what is the obvious message for us here? How do we learn to die to self so that we too can manifest that same selfless spirit? It's not easy because you have to remember some even teachers in all different areas and career you have people saying, my husband is saying, I'm, I'm, uh, if pandemic is at my school, I can't teach anymore. He doesn't want me to bring it home. You had husbands that were on jobs that would say, I can't go home to my family. I got to stay in a hotel because I've tested positive. 
Now, what we know is God, if he can handle pandemics back then, he can handle pandemics today. So when you get to Friday, I want you to go to the discussion questions, and I just want you to, for yourself to think about this. How would you respond if a friend asked you these questions? And some of us have already been asked them. Where is God in my suffering? If he loved me, why am I going through such a difficult time? Those are questions that not only young people will throw at you, but even older adults that are taking Bible studies. And even, be honest, even some of us Christians will ask that question. And if we have been studying our word, we know that God has said, I will be with you even until the end. Him and the Holy Spirit was never going to leave us. And when we see that sky open, we want each and every one of us to be saying, this is our God who we have waited on, and we're going home. So we're going to bow our heads, and I just thank you for your participation and your time that you have spent with us and those at home. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for refreshing our memory on the word that you wanted us to receive today. Lord, thank you for talking through me, speaking through me, through the Holy Spirit, leading and guiding with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Now, Lord, not, not one of us, Lord, should ever keep your word to ourselves. So, Lord, give us your power, your wisdom, your guidance to go out and touch someone in this dying world. Because, Lord, that is your commission for us to go out and make disciples. Lord, all you asked us to do was plant the little mustard seed and you will water and grow it. So we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And I'm sorry, Saints. I want to once again thank El Dorado. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, sister, for taking over Sabbath school for me. The task is not over yet, okay? So, I'll, I'll stick around for a little while, but after next Monday, no, we will see, okay? Um, but thank you very much. And let us remember something. If we didn't get anything out of this Sabbath school lesson, let us remember that as the Christian was persecuted, you know, and they flee from one city to the other because of the persecution, the gospel went right with them. And because of that, you know, the gospel spread like wildfire. That's the same thing going to happen with those of us right before Jesus come. When we go to prison, or wherever we end up at, there went to be people watching us. 
to see why. Now that's okay, we better start with that, we're good. You know, so the thing is, let us remember to maintain faithful despite of whatever go through our life. To maintain faithful to God. And at the right time when Jesus comes, he is going to reward us. Okay? So, he that endures to the end will be saved. Not saying that you're not going to have trouble. All of us were going to have as Christians, as believers. Because the devil is not going to leave us alone. So if we don't have any problem right now, check your Christian life. Because he, the Satan, he wants to make God look bad. You see? And if he make God look bad, he's just satisfying himself. But he's taking us, you know, far as a right just to wish to God. So let us be faithful until the end and he will give us a crown. Okay? Now, um, I didn't have, we're going to sing a closing song, and I guess, who going to? What number it is? surrender to Jesus Christ, I hope we are. 309. All to Jesus, I surrender.
surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Let us pray, dear Father, which art in heaven, as we have made the pledge that we will surrender all to you. We ask you, dear Father, that when the devil comes and throws dark on us, that we will always be mindful and knowing that you will be always be with us. Bless us this morning, dear Father. Bless all the churches around the globe as we worship you in spirit and in truth. And the things that we fail to ask you, O oh Lord, please grant it unto us, I pray. Bless us individually and collectively, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You are dismissed from Sabbath school. And, uh, well, I guess we can start right immediately divine service. If you are... Um, We'll start exactly at 11 o'clock, so we have three minutes, okay?
Okay, we're going to go and get started on uh, 11 o'clock service. I am going to be doing your announcements, and I am Barbara Wilson, and my service here is to give announcements for the Greater Alton SDA Church. Um, for those of you that have any announcements and you want to get up and Tell us what's what, because I don't have everything that I need. What do you want? Oh, okay. You want to come in front, then I'm going to uh, get started. Our 11 o'clock announcements for today is, we have potluck. <laughs> That's not all, but we do have a haystack luncheon after the service. Um, I'm going to uh, start with our food pantry. So our date last week was given the 20th, but the, it's on the 21st from 1030 to 130. Food pantry will be open. Well, this will be our first time for the year, 1030 to 130. April 21st, and that is on a Sunday. And I also have a uh, here from the Southern, Southerner Illinois and Adventist Youth Council. They are making their announcements for 2024 spring camp out. And we do have a flyer, and I will put it out there on the board, so if you want more information, the flyer will be out there or we can make some to pass around. And it starts April 12th through the 14th, where Jine City State Park, no, the 12th, the 12th through the 14th, it starts today, yes. Sorry, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. And I uh, don't know where Jine City State Park but you are welcome to attend this, and they would like to know. Anyone can attend, and your uh, meals, or you have to, on Friday is supper, Sabbath, breakfast, and say here is Sunday meals. If you want, your Sunday meal is on your own. But for Friday, your provided lunch is haystacks and this uh, supper is burritos. And I did give you the address, so I'm gonna give you that now. Jine City State Park is 235 Jine, Jine, G-R-A-N-T. I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but it's Giant City Road, and that's in, Say it again. Yeah, but we've never been there. I am. So two three five City City Road, Man Man M A K A N D A. It's Mankanda, Illinois, and the zip code is six two nine five eight, and the cost. It's no more than four dollars per person per night. So you also can make a donation as well. So they did they did start yesterday. 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 So today and tomorrow they finish up. And this is it this is a youth and young adult event. But everyone of all ages is invited to participate. But you do need to bring your own tent, bedding, camping chair, Bible, and anything you need for camping weekend. And they say showers are available in the main campground. But overall, it sounds like I'm, it's gonna be fun I haven't done camping in, oh, I don't know how long, and I'm not going to try to remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so these are your announcements for today on April the 12th, 2024. And Renato, you have an announcement? Okay, we'll bring you the mic. Okay. Good morning, everyone, again. I know many of you are surprised to see me yours of today, right? But you know, the thing about it is man dispose, but God take action. I don't know what the reason was, you know, that made this thing happen. But I was supposed to get it, but it didn't happen because, for one thing, the person who was supposed to take me to the hospital was sick, got sick. Her phone was lost, and she couldn't communicate with me. So when I tried to call her, 9, nine o'clock that morning, 9.30 that morning, which was only had an hour to get to the hospital, we didn't get in touch with her. Well, two things happened. She got sick and she lost her phone. I was, I tell you something, brother, I'll tell you the plain truth, I was angry. That one the morning, the first, I got angry. I, I flew, I drove, I drove to the office, was ready to, to tell off some stuff. But once they told me that they hadn't heard from her in a week, you know, and don't say, then, my mentality changed. You see, because I know something can happen because she hadn't done nothing like that before. But the thing is, I'm still here. I haven't got the operation. It's postponed until next month, the 17th of next month. I changed doctor because the next time that I would have up uh, with that doctor would be December the 4th. And that would be too long, you know. So we changed doctor and Hopefully, with God's help this time, you know, we will see, you know. I leave everything in God's hand. We have to trust in God. I'm trusting in God that he's going to that the right time. Because this is the third time, <laughs> you know, that it has been postponed. But, you know, God knows the reason why. We sometimes, we don't understand it. But God do. God understand. So, I'm telling you, I know I missed last Sabbath because I had to go to the Spanish church to let them know too that I was home because they were there so here so too. So thank you for your prayers. And Sister Gaina, Gaina, I got a letter from her and a card from her. You know. And if you are watching Sister Gaina, I want to tell you thank you very much for your prayer and your words of comforting. You know, because I know that you told me, that you said that maybe I didn't remember who you were, but I remember you, you sweetest young lady. But God bless you. I still want to go and ride some of your horses too, though. I still want to do that. But um, thank you very much for your word of encouragement. And may God bless each and head every one of you this morning. Okay? I may have mentioned this uh, just before, but it bears repeating. I, I asked the saints to please pray for me. Um, I got a little bit of some news from the uh, North American Division concerning the changes that's coming to the uh, our website. <laughs> the company that we used to go through, Simple Updates, uh, which was in turn uh, supported by the North American Division, Adventist Church Connect. They're going to be switching platforms to, to something called WordPress. Now, I haven't used really WordPress much, so it's going to change a lot of things, uh, including the templates, you know, that we use to display our website now, and of course, the learning curve that comes with it. <laughs> so I ask you to please keep me in your thoughts and prayers as we, as the, the North America uh, makes this adjustment, and it's going to be across the board for the entire, because uh, you know it's paid for through the NAT. Our local church doesn't pay uh, for that access to the internet and website, so that's a blessing. Um, the fact that NAD is doing that for all the churches in this division is a blessing. But the, again,
again, the format that they use, uh, simple updates, or the company that they're working with is changing to WordPress, and that may change the look and feel a little bit, but I'll, I'll do my best, as I've done in the past, to make sure that we're properly represented you know, in our web presence when that happens. But pray for me, okay, because it's always a little frustrating when platforms change and you kind of have to learn all over again, if you know what I mean. Can you all do that for me? Yeah. All right, praise the Lord. Our YouTube channel will still be the same. Nothing changes there, all right? Just our main website. Thank you. All right, our opening uh, hymn this morning, I, I, hymn of affirmation, let me bring up my program here on my iPad is uh, hymn number 672, Spirit of the Living God. 672, Spirit of the Living God. Do we have that clear? 672. Is Cliff back there? Hey, Cliff. Do we have 672, Spirit of the Living God, on the MIDI? Father in heaven, I just want to thank you and praise you for this day, the day in which uh, uh, your mercies are new each day, and we thank you, Father, for that. We thank you, Father, for the power of your Holy Spirit that's already been here with us. We just pray for your continued presence. We pray that uh, by the being here today, that uh, we will be changed, because we know that you want to give us life, and life more abundantly, and we only do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Father, for the promise of your spirit. We thank you for the promise that says where two or three are gathered, that you will be in the midst. We need you, Father. We always want you. Please uh, allow the dynamic to happen today where, uh, where your spirit moves us and changes us to be more like Jesus so that we can be ready for your coming and see you face to face someday. We thank you, Father, for the power of your word and pray that it will come forth today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, Brother Ronaldo, I don't know if you want to lead this, so we didn't know you were going to be here. So, uh, but if you want to lead this, you're welcome to come because the next thing you're going to do is a congregational prayer anyway, so you might as well come on up. Our opening hymn is 500 and... Forty-five. Savior like a shepherd lead us. Five forty-five.
no va a este Good morning again. And, um, it's a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I don't know about you, but last Sabbath on my way, I was coming here, you know. But I say, you know something? The Spanish church was expecting to hear from me to, you know, so I said, well, I will skip here today over in Alton and go to, uh-oh, somebody I'll go back there. Well, is that the damage has been done, so, you know. But you see, the truth about it is this. I have two congregations, okay? I have two congregations. Sometimes I want to hear the Spanish congregation too, you know, so that I don't lose my, you know, I would just say my uh, Spanish heritage, let's put it like that, you know. But you know, God understands. If anything, God do understands our problem, you know. And he will always resolve it. So I'm very happy to be here today. And I'll tell you this, I will be here until about the 17th of next month. After the 17th, I don't know. Okay? But um, I will be around. And God, God is in control of everything. Okay, let's put it like that. You know, he is the one that decide when things happen in people's life, what we want it or not. If we are believers, if we truly trust God, he, you know, is the one who will guide our footsteps. So um, that is my thing. I just thank God. And like I mentioned earlier, I thank you for your prayers, even though it didn't happen. But God knows why it didn't happen, right? And the letters and the card that I received, like I was here from Sister G Diana Knight. I don't know if she's watching, you know, because she had told me in the letter that she was, that she watched me almost every Sabbath, uh, every Sabbath, you know, the things that, that we do here. So she must be watching right now. So thank you again, Sister G I call her Gina, but she says she likes Diana, <laughs> you know, Diana Knight. But thank you for that. And with that, we'll ask anyone have any petition? Yes, sister. Was it that the director of the youth choir of the children yes. choir? Yes. That's a, oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Huh? Mm, okay. Yeah. I am. Um, the last time I saw them was when they had the concert over there, so that even the agape choir was there, so. I'm, they light up the church, the north side church, the loves young people light up. I remember it. And the other one was Acewood East, I think it was. Huh? West. It's Acewood West. Uh, that was the last, that was what, two months ago. And she directed that choir, the young people choir. The lighting up that, that thing. Oh, that's daughter. Oh, okay. Well, my mistake. Any other, other prayer requests?
Shara says her name. Shara. 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 You know, Brother Scott Beck will give you this counsel, which I say it all the time, is this. If you don't have any problem, you know, your worship to God is, is not good. Because the devil, and as we're studying this week lesson, and as we continue to study, you see, God's people are going to pass through all kind of a stuff. So, it's good that you're passing through it because with that you will recognize that God is in your life. We, we cannot do anything without God, you see. So this little struggle that you have, hold, just hold on. Yeah. That daughter of yours will come back around, you see. Sometimes, sometimes it take a little bit of, you know, things to happen, you know, but they will come around. Trust me, just keep on praying and we will be praying for you. And um, the other thing, like Owa mentioned before, uh, finances, God is the king of finances. He owns everything, doesn't he? And he will just give you what you need, you know, to accept. that's it. But sometimes we ourselves, we kind of overdo it. You know what I mean? And instead of a blessing, what we get is a curse. And the devil used that, you know, to attack family also, you know. But don't worry, keep on praying. Keep on having your family devotion. Keep on consecrating your children to God, your daughter to God. And in the end, you will be victorious. I'll tell you this, that, that daughter of yours is going through a teenage phase. You know what I mean? And sometimes, we all, sometimes we go through that phase. That happened to me. I myself, you know, I'll tell you that. I rejected God, didn't want to know anything about God. But that's a phase that teenagers go through. But keep on praying, keep on having your, your worship. And in the end, you will be victorious. This is my counsel to you, okay? Anyone else? Yeah, uh, yeah. I know you live in town too. Yeah, uh-huh.
And another thing that I can just give that brother Scar about the grounds. The devil know what trying to do, you know, what God has prepared for this place. Yeah. You see. So he's just trying to obstruct, you know, what God's plans are. But don't worry, let us keep on praying for this church. So because in the end, like I was say, we are going to be victorious, okay? Don't be surprised if other things doesn't happen, you know, because the devil is about to, you know, he knows he, he, he's on his last leg. You see, he's on his last leg, so he's going to do everything, you know, to stop the word of God. But don't worry, we will be all right. Okay, family and church, family, someone else? I can see oh sister sister Harper, she likes to write down everything, but God, this is a lot of writing, you know. <laughs> Anyone else? If not, I tell you what. Um for those let me see, let me see. I think I got everything, Sister Wilson, you say for the pantry and for the children. Children in school. Right. And now I'm finished writing. So, and let me see, let me, let me make sure. Anyone else? Anyone else? I don't see anyone else. So, let us. Bow our heads or kneel if you want to kneel. I know I cannot kneel, but I'm going to what name there, so, so let us pray. Let. Dear Father and our God, we come before you, Father, with different words of gratitude that sometimes even complain. But we know, oh Father God, that you will resolve our problem and will give us the strength to go through it. I ask you this morning to comfort the family of the North Side Church, Sister Thomas, oh Lord. I ask you to, you know, sometimes losing a family member is very hard. But, O oh Lord, if you have made us the promise that if we are faithful, if they are faithful, they will see that person again. So help, O oh Father, that the Thomas family may be comforted, not with our words, but the words that you give to them, so that they may at least put a closure to their problem of that which is sin. I ask you, the Lord, to be with Sister Sharon, Rodney Aunt, and his family, his mother-in-law, and his wife, and his son, that you give them the strength, O oh Lord, to endure 
whatever comes their way. Comfort them, O oh Lord, to let them know that you are still in the midst of them. When trouble rises up, O oh Lord, we can still call on you, and you will always come to help us. I ask you to bless Brother Scott and his family. The little problem that we have, O oh Lord, we know that this work of the arch enemy has sold. And that that person, O oh Lord, with the training that they have had from the beginning of life until now, it's just a phase that they are going through, O oh Lord. But I ask you to give the family strength and confidence in you, knowing that you, in the end, going to be victorious because the devil has already been defeated. So I ask you, Father, to comfort them in the little problem they're worried about finances, oh Lord. I ask you that you will provide what they need, just enough for what they need, oh Lord. And I ask you to bless them, the Gonzalez family, in a special way, because they are very, very consecrated to you. If so, Lord, if things come up, I ask you to illuminate the heart and their mind so that they may see the magnificence God that we serve and that you will come true for them. Okay. I ask you to bless Steve and his family and the church around the globe and we worship you dear father there are hundreds and thousands of family worship worshiping you today and this blessed Sabbath day I ask you father that you may give us a special Sabbath day blessing individually and collectively and the problem that we have in your Lord and and the grounds of this building of your temple, we know that it's just Satan that is working on, on it. But we know that in the end, we will be victorious. I ask you to be with the workers who came out last week to work on the food pantry, oh Lord. Like the lesson said this morning, oh Lord, the community, we have an obligation to the community. And when we fulfill that obligation, oh Lord, you're going to bring in the sheaves. So help us to do our part in spreading the gospel of love that you have commanded us to do. And in the end, oh Lord, we are going to be victorious. I ask you to be with those children in school, with all those things that are happening around. We heard again a lot yesterday, I believe it's in the news, of the attack on another school. But we know, oh Father God, that once the government took out the prayer out of school, then now the devil ent entered in and all these maladies is happening. But we know, oh Lord, that you will protect those who later on will give their life to you you will go to protect them. And Lord, help us to believe, to trust, to be obedient, oh Lord, to draw laws to your status, and that we show our love to one another so that the world can see that we, yes, are your disciples if we manifest that love to each other, to you first, oh Lord, and then now to our neighbors or to the world. We thank you for being our God. And where we have failed you, Father God, I ask you this morning that you will grant us those blessings. And forgive us, oh Lord, if we have done anything to offend you. I ask you, Father God, to please forgive us. We thank you because you are a merciful Father 
And we thank you because you gave us your only begotten Son, that he would take up my sins, or our sins, and take it up to the cross in that which we have salvation. Thank you, Father God, for hearing and for answering our prayer, I pray in the precious name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, amen and amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, I'm going to ask our adults to think back. And I think our students here don't have to think as far back as we have to. The first thing I want you to do is use your imagination. I want you to imagine that this is a big computer, OK? And it's sitting at home on your desk. This is the big computer. Now. Before I tell you the name of our story, how many of you can remember back to high school when you had to take math? You know, that was so much fun when I was in algebra. And then when they went to geometry, and my brother had a statement, she's brain dead. When it came to algebra, I mean geometry, I was just like, oh, why me? <laughs> why? And I, you know, I kept talking to my mom, can you get me out of that class? She's like, no. So I want you to know, when it comes to math, guess what? How many of you cook? Raise your hand, even some men cook. You know, if you don't know measurements and you don't know math, you don't know what you're gonna produce. And most of the time, if you don't know what ingredients and how much to put in, nobody's eating your cooking. So we just thank you for Ann and, and, and First Lady Carol when they do cooking, and, and Glenda when she comes from Chicago, because most of the time they don't need a cookbook. But I learned that when you're teaching young people, and I had a gourmet foods class, and then we changed the name to culinary arts, and trying to teach them to cook without the math skills didn't work. So I found myself staying after school many days, getting with the math teacher saying, look, they stuck this kid in my class, they can't do math, and what am I supposed to do with them when it comes to cooking? She goes, we don't know what to do with them when it comes to math, so we can't help you. So our story today is coming from Russia. And we're going to be talking about a little boy named Daniel. And his title of this story is Praying Problems Away. He's only 11 years old. And he's a fifth grader. And of course, he's struggling with math homework. So on his computer at home in Russia, he lives far north, he's able to solve all of the problems except one. And he's like, look, this problem is very, very hard. So he tries another way to solve it. It doesn't work. Then he tried the second way. Doesn't work. So by the time he got to being on this one problem for 10 minutes, he decided, I'm not going to be able to solve this. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to go get my dad. Now notice now, dad is busy himself. Dad is on his cell phone, and he's 
doing Texan. So the son comes in, quote, Father, I can't solve the math problem, he says. So his father puts down his phone, and he was very much into texting. So he comes in and he goes, well, show me the problem on the computer. And so they look at it, and then father goes, well, I can't solve it either. But dad says, quote, let's pray. God, can you solve this problem? He definitely will help you. Dad went on to say, Daniel, you bow your head and close your eyes. Dear God, Father prayed, thank you for being with us. You know Daniel needs to solve this math problem. We can't figure it out, but we know you can. Please help us. Amen. So as Daniel goes on, he comes running in and says, oh, maybe I'll try this, he says. And he does. And he solves that math problem. Then he goes on. He goes, okay, I'm doing really good at this. Then, quote, see, I told you that God would help you, his father smiled. So he didn't know what to expect when he got to school next time. So he's just smiling. He's so happy as the sun. He says, my smile is brighter than the sun. And guess what? He's hurrah, and I got that math problem right. And then a day or two later, Daniel's struggling with another math problem. He goes, okay, I'll see if I can solve it this way. It doesn't work. He tried another way. It doesn't work. Ten minutes, he tried again. Finally, he got sad. And he said, look, there's only one thing for me to do again. I'm going to get dad. But see, this time, mom has dad in the kitchen, and she's got him peeling potatoes. Here comes Daniel running. Dad, 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 got a problem again. Can't solve it. So his dad puts down the potatoes. You see, mother was in the middle of making a soup called boshkosh, and it's a beet soup, but she needed those potatoes. But, quote, father said, I can't solve the math problem either, Daniel. So father looks at the problem again and again. He said, it's just too difficult for me to solve. So let's pray. So dad begins to pray. God, can you solve this problem? He definitely will help you. He goes on and father said, I'm going to bow my head. I'm going to close my eyes. And each time dad bowed his head and closed his eyes, Daniel bowed his head and closed his eyes. And guess what? Dad didn't even have to tell him. He actually followed his father's example. So, dear God, thank you for being with us, Father Pray. You know that Daniel needs to solve this math problem. We can't figure it out, but you can. Please help us. Amen. So father went back to peeling his potatoes and Daniel raised his head and opened his eyes. He still couldn't solve the problem. So finally, after five minutes, here comes Daniel running in the kitchen. Dad, 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 guess what? And his father looks at him, he says, yes, son. Father, I solved the problem. Father was so happy. God wants to show you that he can solve any problem, not just the math problem, but every area of your life. Amen. So Daniel knew that it was true. God could help him anytime, anywhere, and all that he needed, all he had to do was ask. So, your 13th Sabbath is going to go to open in a, a school in Sokhart in Russia North. And your next 13th Sabbath will be coming up in June the 29th. So, this center will help all children and adults learn about God and that will teach them how to pray to God for everything that they need. And don't forget our monies when we collect here at the church for the young people. They will be helping someone go to camp. 
So could we bow our heads? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our young people, our children. They are gifts from you, Lord. And Lord, you promised us in your word that they will not come back void. So Lord, as you touch their hearts, Lord, even those that are around them that may be distracting them, Lord, Lord, we ask that you will keep their minds focused on you and that we know, Lord, that you know you said raise a child in the way they should go and they will not depart. So, Lord, we know that the world has many distractions, but, Lord, we know your children will continue to be faithful to you even until the end. And we thank you for our young people, our children, and our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren. So just thank you for being an awesome God and hearing and answering prayers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And could I thank you? Amen. Your daughters are going to take me on a strike pretty soon. Every time they come, i got something for them to do. story sister patty you know you made me think of something sister patty when you was talking about that boy has uh, having trouble solving his problem mm -hmm. you know the, my bible you made me think of this text right here in the book of Jer jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27 and the word of the lord says behold i am the lord the god of all flesh is there anything too hard for me amen yeah. now Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. So, beloved, I challenge you today, Elder Scott, with what you're going through. I want you to think about that text, my brother. I'll read it again for emphasis for all of us, myself included. Jeremiah 32, chapter 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? That's a that's not a rhetorical question. That's something that we all need to take on a personal level, Amen. no matter what we're going through. Amen? Amen? And I would dare say nothing is too hard for the Lord. Amen? Amen. You know, uh, as we transition to our, 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 our giving, which is an act of worship, you know, I know I have Malachi on the board, which is our standard text, but I was, the Spirit guided me to Psalm 50. Uh, and I'm going to read a few, just a few verses as we think about worshiping God and giving. The Bible says in Psalm verse 50, the, the 50th division of the Psalm, verse one, the mighty God, even the Lord, had spoken and had called and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down, to the going down thereof. Verse five, gather my saints together unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. You see, that's what God is trying to teach us through giving, right? He's trying to teach us how to sacrifice because we sin for earthly sometime or stingy, and we want to hold on to our stuff, right? But God would remind us of something in this psalm, so let me read a little bit further, okay? Uh, verse, verse 10, beginning with verse 10. For God says in his word, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. And listen to what God says, says, says here. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. What's his? The world is his and its fullness. So everything that we work our, life, work our entire lives for already belongs to him. We physically belong to him. Mind, body, and spirit. Amen? The world belongs to him, and the Bible says, as I just read, and this fullness there, thereof. So what we're really doing is just giving back to God his own stuff. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And God has a blessing for those who do that. You know why I know? Because the same psalm tells me so. If I jump down to verse 14, the Bible says in Psalm 50, 50 division, 14, verse 14, Offer to God thanksgiving. 
and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And here's the promise, Elder Scott. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Amen? Amen. We can always count on God. You know, our, our prophetess once said in her, in her inspired writings many times, she says, all the promises as well as all the threatenings of, like, of God are like conditional. Amen? If we are willing to be faithful and do our part, God will certainly do his part without fail. Amen? Amen? If there's any failure, sometimes we have to look to just the fallenness of this world. Sometimes things that we go through uh, may appear a failure. Satan will try to make us to think it's our fault. But he's really the, the devilish mastermind, mastermind behind this, Elder Scott. You know, we've all done what we can do to the best of our ability sometimes. And sometimes things don't work out. But, but perhaps it's just a little test for us. Amen? Amen. A test of faith because we have the promise right here in God's word. He says, call up on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Yes. So I would have you all think about that today as we transition to, uh, to returning our tithe and offering to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Uh, let us uh, lift the morning's tithe and offering. And if we have, let us pray for it. And those who are not here and watching online, please remember uh, to give online at our church website. Amen? Shall we bow our heads? Father, in the name of Jesus, we've been reminded in your holy word that everything in this world belongs to you. If we have anything that we made, it's that we made through, through our work, it's only because you blessed us. You blessed us with life and breath given us various, various skills and abilities and knowledge and understanding. And it's only through that grace of your blessings that we're able to do anything. We know that without you, we can do nothing. And so we thank you for giving us a portion of health and strength in our, in our bodies as men and women to work while it is still day. For the night will come, according to your word, when no one, no man or woman can work. So help us to work to provide for our families, but above even the, the secular work, help us to work for the sake of the gospel so that your word may go forth into all the world. Please bless these funds according to thy will um, that your work may go forward without hindrance. Here's our prayer in the name of Jesus we pray this morning, and we thank you. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 14. Now all these things happen unto them for ensembles, and they are written for our admonitions upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry.
Psalms 122, it says, I was glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord, right? <laughs> There's many reasons to be glad. You know, we go through challenges and trials in life, but, uh, you know, the, the reason why we're glad to come up to the house of the Lord is because our church family is there. And there's where we find the love of God flowing through his people. And uh, that's, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. It encourages us and strengthens us and helps us on our way. Right? Amen? So are you glad this morning? Amen. Uh, amen. Amen. I'm glad you all are. Thank you, Anna, for that special. Uh, oh, how I love Jesus, right? That's really the difference, isn't it, between serving God and serving something else. It's that. You know, when you have the love of God in your heart, you have life, Amen. and you have life more abundantly. And so uh, uh, we love Jesus because he first loved us. Amen. And uh, the, uh, um, I wanted to continue on with uh, the part two of uh, this message, The Tale of Two Temptations, which is uh, second in the series, uh, Follow the Old Waymarks. And... Uh, Today, we will continue in the series, uh, Follow the Old Waymarks. You know, if you've ever been in, uh, in a position where you've been walking through the woods, you, you, ever, you ever remember that, where you're walking through the woods, or you're walking through a forest, or you're walking through a dark way? You ever been, that, you ever been there before? You ever been, been in that, that situation? What is easier to do, to follow a deer path or to follow a well-worn path? Well, <laughs> Believe me, I've made it through the woods on a deer path, but it's not very easy. It's not very easy. So, and so it's better to follow a well-worn path, isn't it? And what makes it even better is if you have way marks. You know, something that says, okay, this, you're on this trail. You're on, you know, maybe it's a red trail, or maybe you're on the blue trail, or maybe you're on a green trail. And so that is why God has preserved for us in his word these stories of people because we can see that they were people just like us and that if they triumph and overcome then we can triumph and triumph and overcome but the uh, contrast is there as well because we can also see where people just like us failed and those stories always make me cringe I really do not like to read the stories of people that were chosen by God but failed for God and and unfortunately unfortunately we have the stories of a whole nation a church an Old Testament church called Israel that was called by God was given great advantage had the, God had a beautiful plan laid out for them but unfortunately more often than not they failed but here's the good news here's the good news that even in the midst of those failures, God was somehow able to preserve a lineage, preserve a people, so that the Messiah could come. Amen. So that the Messiah could come. I, 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 one of these days, I'm going to ask, when I get to heaven, I'm going to find an Israelite. It doesn't matter which tribe they're from. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll interview somebody from each tribe. Maybe that'd be more interesting. Inter interview somebody from Issachar, from, Na uh, from Naphtali, and find out from them, did you guys understand what this whole thing was about? What the whole nation of Israel was about? Did you understand that this was about preserving a people for the Messiah? Steve? <laughs> right. They probably did. They probably did. But, you know, that, that's the thing. Because it seems like the children of Israel were surrounded by pagan nations that were worshiping false idols, and they thereby fell into the trap of going with the nations. You know, that's a stark lesson for us today, isn't it? Because the Bible says flee temptations, doesn't it? The Bible says good uh, that, uh, uh, how does it say, uh, cor corrupt company corrupts good habits or something like that? In other words, we're supposed to avoid... Uh, being of the world. Jesus said, be in the world, but be not of the world, right? So that's a, sometimes a delicate balance to, to, you know, walk. But the Holy Spirit is there so that we can navigate the narrow way 
and uh, be able to find those way marks along the narrow way that help us to lead us to the kingdom of God and lead us to God's heart. Now, last time, who remembers last time who I, which king I talked about? Which king did we say? Who? Saul. Saul. Okay. So, and I gave you a clue as to what part two was going to be about. And that was King David. King David. Okay. The reason why I chose these two kings in part one, part two, is because there is a temptation that came upon both of these kings at the very early part of their reign. They, it didn't come in the same exact form, but the essence of the temptation was the same. And the essence was, am I going to trust God or am I going to trust myself? That was the essence. We talked about Saul and how he failed. When he was facing his enemies, he failed because instead of waiting for Samuel, he decided to go ahead and offer a sacrifice. Now we're going to look at David and see what temptation he came across and see how he succeeded. He succeeded where Saul failed. So we're going to be looking at that. But I'm getting way ahead of myself, so let me back up here and go through this introduction. Um, the uh, Remember, as Grace just read, thank you, Grace, for reading that this morning, we talked about that God gave us these stories for in samples, that they are for our admonition. And so uh, that's what we are going to be doing today, looking at the, uh, the prophet, uh, or looking at King David. Um, in studying the life of King David, we will follow the same pattern as we did before, okay? There's many things that we could say. Let me just throw it out there. When you think of King David, what do you think of? Anybody, anybody can answer. When you, when you, what's that? A man after God's own heart. We're going to touch on that a little bit. Anybody else? When you think of King David, what do you think of? He was a shepherd. What? A devoted man to God. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so I can tell you, and Anna, uh, you got this ready? I can tell you what, what every time I think of David, I think of this song. And you can join me if you want to join. I'm sure you know this song. It's been played in Sabbath schools for many, many years, okay? And Anna, actually, I just mentioned this to Anna last night. I said, I wonder if we could play this. I was just kind of thinking out loud. You have to be careful with Anna thinking out loud because when, when, <laughs> when you do, she'll, she'll run with it, and she did. So I guess she sat down with Ann this morning, and they figured out how to play this song. They, she's never played it before, except for this morning. So let's see how it goes, okay? You know the song, Only a Boy Named David? Only, are you ready? Okay, let's see if we can sing it now. Let's go through one more time. Only a boy named David, only a little sling. Only a boy named David, but he could play and sing. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David, but five little stones he took. And one little stone the sling and the sling went round and round and one little stone went in the sling and the sling went round and round and around 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 and one little stone went up in the air and giant came tumbling down <laughs> right yeah I, I can't think of David without thinking of that song because I learned it in Sabbath school many years ago and uh, so I think about that, that David did something that 
even uh, trained soldiers that were hardened, seasoned soldiers did not, were not able to do. And you would, yeah, it's one of those stories that makes me think, duh. I mean, the sling was the closest thing they had to a shotgun, right? To a rifle. So why wouldn't you use that? But God gave David wisdom, and he gave him ability. But there's also something else that I don't want to miss in that, and I didn't even really include that in my sermon, so this is kind of a side note. This is for extra credit, whatever you want to call it. The Spirit of Prophecy explains to us, and Brother Rodney, I know you and I have talked about this at Potluck before. So, uh, Goliath moved the helmet back. He moved the helmet back. And so that that's, was David's golden opportunity, and he... With God's help, he succeeded in knocking that giant down, right? So we do not need to be afraid of our giants, do we? Because God will find a way. God will find a way. So basically, we're going to follow the same pattern that we did before in looking at the life of David. We're going to be looking at the times in which, the, uh, which he lived, the highlights of his life, and the takeaways that we can apply to our own lives, okay? So those are just three simple things we're going to do. We're going to be looking at the times in, in which uh, David lived, the highlights of his life, and also the, the takeaways. So the times in which uh, David lived is just like king, for King Saul. They were contemporaries. They lived at the same period of time. And the, they were still within the midst of the time of the judges, when, in which you find at the end of the book of Judges, it says that every man did what was right in his own eyes, okay? So the time of Judges was a time of, you could basically say it was chaos and confusion, okay? God was still very much working with the children of Israel. He was still very much involved. But the children of Israel, the Old Testament church was on this roller coaster ride, as we had mentioned before, that they were serving God. And then when they were prosperous and everything was fine, everything was easy, then they forgot about God and they started serving Baal. They started serving all these gods around them. When they served the gods around them, God allowed them to be overtaken by Satan, by other nations, and thereby they then re repented, turned back to God, and uh, went, uh, went into a, a time of reformation again. So we had this roller coaster ride in the time of Judges. And so the uh, King Saul, King David came, came out of that backdrop, okay, came out of that backdrop. So in uh, Judges 1, 20, verse 21, um, we find out that uh, David was of the tribe of Judah. Now, I want to make a cor correction on that because last week I said that uh, David, David and Saul were of the same tribe. No, it's very easy to get them mixed up because, you know, eventually Benjamin assimilated into Judah. They became one tribe. But it, so, so they're very closely related. They're very closely related. But the, but the fact of the matter was is that it said that uh, Benjamin would not be continued to rule, would not continue to rule. And so it switched to the house of Judah, and thereby you have Jesus becoming the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? Because that's the other thing I wanted to point out about David in his, in the, in, uh, in his background is that he actually came from the uh, lineage the messianic lineage that he was in within the messianic lineage okay what that means is that he came through that line in which jesus was to come so basically if you read your bible you find out that you had boaz and ruth which is uh, interesting because the moabitess was a progenitor of the messiah okay so you have the uh, boaz and ruth ruth and, and boaz they they conceived obed obed conceived jesse jesse conceived david okay and so it go, go on down the line, and you end up at Joseph, the father of Jesus. So that's how it works. So he, David was in that messianic line. We don't have that with Saul. Uh, but uh, but the, that's, that's the way it was. So um, the, the uh, timeline, talking about the times in which David lived, the, the timeline in which uh, uh, David lived was very interesting because if you consider that uh, starting from the beginning in the book of Genesis, you have the start of the Old Testament church. You start, have the start of time, but then you have Abraham, you have Jacob, and, and so on, and, and then it goes on down. And then you find in Exodus that for 400 plus years,
Thank you. You find that uh, for 400 plus years, the Old Testament church was in Egypt, okay? And then uh, they were led out by Moses, right? And uh, then they were led by Joshua. And then they, uh, this is interesting, watch this number. There was actually 14 judges. That's an interesting number, isn't it? There was 14 judges. And Samuel was one of those, and Samuel was the last one. Samuel was the last one. And so you find that the, you have this succession going on. What I find fascinating uh, is uh, the order, the order of the Bible. Because if you look at the order of the Bible, it follows the exact sequence of the Old Testament church. Okay? Now, stop and think about it. You got Genesis, Exodus. And then you have the rest of the books that were written by Moses. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? And then you have Joshua. Then you have Judges. Wait a minute, what about Ruth? Why was Ruth thrown in there? Because it was to identify the, the fact that King David was in that messianic lineage, right? You remember the golden thread that runs throughout the entire Bible is the Messiah, that God will provide a way for his people to get back to him. That's the golden thread that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. There is a way for humanity to get back to God through the Messiah. So this is, this is what uh, he's, uh, is very fascinating, that there was 14 judges. But also there's another number here I don't want you to miss. From the, from the time of Joshua... All the way until Samuel, it was about 400 years. So about another 400 years. So they were in captivity in Egypt for about 400 years, 400 plus years. And then they went another 400 plus years, and that brought you to the time of the kings. Isn't it interesting? The, the, the Bible is very uh, numerically uh, interesting. It's, it's very sound in the way God has done things. What does all this mean? It just basically means that God has put these in here for our encouragement, for our help, to help us to understand that we are not serving an ordinary God. We're not, ser we're not so serving a God of wood and stone, okay? We're serving a God who's very intelligent, okay? And he's put these things in there so that we will understand that he is real and that the Bible is no ordinary book, okay? And so there, that's the, to all, all that's very fascinating. So uh, David comes to the throne in times of hostile nations surrounding them, relig religious apostasy, general ignorance of God's laws. Why do I say the uh, general ignorance of God's laws? You know, as fascinating as the life of David was, and as intelligent as he was, and as a mighty warrior as he was, do you realize that he was ignorant of God's laws? How do I know that? Because when they went to transport the Ark of the Covenant, King David was goofy enough to put the thing on an ox cart. That's not the way God said to transport the Ark. God said it was supposed to be carried by the Levites with staves, right? But David was ignorant of that fact. He didn't know that. And that kind of shows, identifies where David was in his time, in his place. The other, uh, the other thing that shows his ignorance, which really led the nation into one of the greatest apostasies there was, and that is multiple wives. God made it very clear that they were not supposed to multiply wives unto themselves. They were not supposed to add land to themselves. But David was ignorant of that fact. And, and thereby, that, that sin of multiplying wives led Solomon to do that ten times over, a hundred times over, whatever it was. It was terrible. And that uh, multiplying wives was actually what led the nation of Israel into one of the greatest times of apostasy because they had the greatest light, but then they were actually running down the pathway, running down the toilet of, of uh, worshiping Baal and all these other asterisks. And do you know, and I'm kind of going all over this morning, I, I don't know, I'm just following the spirit, but did you know that Solomon... And this, and this is kind of like a precursor because I think Solomon is on my radar for, for another sermon. But did you know that Solomon, that wonderful story at the beginning where he preserved that baby. Do you remember that story where the two mothers were fighting over this baby? 
And, and he had the soldier come in with a sword and said, okay, split the baby in half and give one half to the one mother and one half to the other mother. Remember Solomon uh, stopped and said, wait, the one that's crying over the baby and everything, that's the mother. Give the baby to him. Do you realize that that same Solomon that preserved the life of that child was the same Solomon that because of one of his wives set up an altar to the sacrifice of children? To the sacrifice of children. Did you know that? So was, was David clear on the law? No, he was not clear on the law. He did not. He had, there was a lot of ignorance there. And so one of the things he, he did was multiply wives, and that was not a really a smart thing to do. It actually led uh, the nation into a, great, a greater apostasy. So um, we need to remember, too, that we don't know everything, you know. About the time we think that uh, we know everything, we're kind of in dangerous ground. Remember the Bible says, take heed if you think you stand, lest you fall, right? So that's a lesson for us. So the, um, we have the here, um, well, I'm not going to run down that, but there, there's, a, there's a fascinating history here that I was going to run down through, but I'm kind of running uh, down through, uh, running out of time here, so I'm just going to move on. If you want that, that little side note, then I'll give that to you uh, later on. But uh, the highlights of David's life, uh, it, so we basically understand that the times in which uh, David lived was uh, the times of the judges, it was a time of apostasy, and the heathen nations around them always giving them troubles, and this is where David began to reign. Now the highlights of David's life, there's many things that we could talk about, right? And uh, they, like I said, I made the correction that uh, David was a Judean. He was from the tribe of Judah. Judah. And uh, he um, also was from the town of Bethlehem. Now, isn't that interesting? I already said that David was in the lineage of the Messiah. But also the Lord preserved his story as a, a picture of the coming Messiah. You know, just like Abraham on Mount Moriah when he sacrificed Isaac, that was a, 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 a little uh, precursor to the cross, a little uh, picture of what was to come. This is what David was too. David started out as a humble shepherd boy, right? Just like Jesus started out as a humble carpenter's son. And Jesus rose to prominence just like David rose to prominence, right? And just like David was a shepherd, Jesus was also a shepherd of his people. And he is our shepherd. He is our kinsman redeemer. And so this is, uh, this is the thing that's beautiful about the, the connection there. David's life was really a life that helps us to see that uh, Jesus is the Messiah. So David, I already mentioned David was in the Messianic lineage. Uh, coming from Boaz and Ruth, Obed and Jesse. So he was a, uh, he also was the youngest son. Now that gives me encouragement, brothers and sisters, because I'm the youngest of my family, right? And sometimes we wonder, can anything good come out of the youngest, right? <laughs> so so uh, praise God that he can work with even mud, work with a donkey. So uh, I'm glad that he can work with me too. Um, David was anointed king by Samuel. Okay, and uh, then God started to prep David for a royal life by making him a hired musician for King Saul, right? Does God prepare us for that which is to come? Often he does, doesn't he? Other times he asks us to step down into Jordan before the waters part, right? But even when he asks us to step down into Jordan, he's prepared us beforehand, hasn't he? So... And then he was, a, uh, he was a man after God's own heart. That was mentioned, wasn't it? Uh, Sister Patsy, you mentioned that. You find that in 1 Samuel 13, 14. And how many did you know you can also find that in Acts 13, verse 22? Acts 13, 22 as well. So he, he was a man after uh, God's own heart. And remember I said last time about Saul, that Saul was a man after the people's own heart. But David was chosen by God as a man after his own heart. So that's a very interesting difference. 
Now, I want to uh, take you to the Bible. Let's, uh, uh, let's go to 2 Samuel 5, 17 through 25. I want you to go there. Time to wake up your fingers and wake up your brain. Let's go do a little digging here. 1 Samuel. No. No, uh, excuse me. Second Samuel, sorry, I was looking above at the first Samuel, the one that talks about he's being a man after God's own heart. So uh, Second Samuel 5, uh, 17 through 25. All right. Let's uh, read a little bit here about something. In uh, verse 17, chapter 5, 2 Samuel 5, 17, this is where the second temptation, the tale of two temptations, that's where I got my message from, this was a similar temptation to what Saul went through. But David succeeded where Saul failed, okay? So it says here, But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, and all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold, the Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, <clears throat> Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal-perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me. <coughs> Excuse me. As in the breach of waters, therefore he called the name of that place Baalparazim. Okay, moving on from there. They said there that, and they there they left their images. Thank you. It says there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. That was a good thing, right? And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, now notice this is where I really want you to sit up and take notice. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come up uh, them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba, even unto thou come to Gezer. Okay, let me remind you real quick of what happened with King Saul. In case you don't remember what I mentioned last time. The same enemies, which was the Philistines, Saul was up against. He was supposed to wait for Samuel to come and offer sacrifice and worship before they went out. Simple instructions, right? He was supposed to wait. And Saul had a problem, which is indicative of the problem with his attitude. And that is he had people leaving him. Now, if Saul had stood up and been a wise king and said, Hey, don't leave. God's going to deliver us. God's going to be faithful. He's been delivered us before. He will deliver us again. It doesn't matter what the hosts of the Philistines look like. They can have all their iron pieces, all their iron weapons if they want. God still can deliver. And by the way, we just had a deliverance from the prophet Samuel where God just simply thundered and he took out the enemy. If King Saul would have been doing that, he wouldn't have had the problem that he had, which he had people defecting, he had people leaving him. People were leaving. So Saul, instead of having faith, was getting nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, right? And instead of having the patience to wait for Samuel, he actually stepped into a role which was not his. And he thereby started offering the sacrifice, started doing the, the office of a priest, which was not his to do. And it was a very foolish thing for him to do. He failed. He failed. But let's step back a minute and look at the elements in that particular situation so that we can compare it to what David went through. You have a mighty king, a mighty warrior, right? Who had already, been, had already succeeded in several battles. The Lord had delivered through him and through the people many times. All right? And the, the simple instruction, he had simple instruction, wait. 
wait until I tell you to go. And Saul failed. Now compare that with David. A mighty king, a mighty warrior, right? Who had already succeeded in many battles before. He had gone up to the same host that King Saul went up to, the Philistines. And can you imagine this? God telling this mighty warrior, wait for the wind and the mulberry trees? What? What? Wait for the wind and the mulberry trees? What's that all about? But you know what? You know what? David succeeded because he says, all right, if that's what God wants me to do, then that's what I'll do, right? You know, a lot of times the way God leads does not make sense. At least to us, it does not make sense. It usually makes sense after the fact, but it doesn't make sense to us going into it. I mean, look at the battle, the battle of Jericho. I mean, who would have thought that I can take this mighty city by marching around it six days and marching around it seven times on the seventh day and shouting with trumpets and everything else? Who would have thought? But... God's ways are sometimes beyond searching out, aren't they? They don't make sense to us, but they make sense because God's saying to do that. So here you have this mighty warrior, King David, saying, hmm, okay, got to wait for the wind and the mulberry trees. Can you imagine him telling his men that? Hey, fellas, we've already taken out thousands of Philistines, but you know what we're going to do this time? We're going to go around the backside here and we're going to wait for the wind and the mulberry trees. We're going to do what? Yeah, we're going to wait for the wind and the mulberry trees. Okay. <laughs> they had trusted David enough, that, and they trusted God enough that they said, okay, we're going to do that. Now, what about you, brothers and sisters? What about me? Is God asking us to do something really strange and unusual? Okay. So I encourage you, wait for the wind and the mulberry trees. I encourage you to do that because... God's going to do something. And we don't know what it's going to be, but God's going to do something. So, the highlights from David's life, this is one of the greatest ones. And this is where the sermon title comes from, The Tale of Two, Two Temptations. Because I'm so glad to read that King David succeeded where Saul failed. And uh, it was a great victory for Israel. Under the hand of David... The Philistines were subdued. By the way, the Philistines should have been subdued a long time ago, but they had to wait all the way until King David, 400 years later, 400 plus years later, to deal with these Philistines. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Sometimes if we let our enemies be, when God tells us to take them out, they get stronger, and that's just the way it was. So sometimes we need to do things, we need to do things what God tells us to do speedily. Otherwise, things become a whole lot worse than what they are now. So, takeaways. Takeaways. Well, number one, uh, David was a uh, nobody, but God made him a somebody. God may want the same for you, right? Think about it. God was, uh, uh, David was a nobody, just a little shepherd boy, the youngest of his, of his brothers, but God made him a somebody. God um, may do the same for you. Second, watch the little things. Watch the, th the little things in your life. Uh, because David passed many tests of faith and trust in God before he became a king. You know? He passed many, many tests um, of little things. Like when he was a shepherd boy, the lion, the bear, right? He wasn't going to sit around saying... Oh, I don't believe in God. I don't believe he can rescue that lamb out of that bear. I don't believe. No, he didn't do that. He said, no, God can deliver. God can deliver. And he'll get me and he'll help me get that sheep out of the mouth of that bear. And he'll help me get the sheep out of the mouth of that lion. Right? So that's just two examples. But there were many things that David did that probably is not even recorded in the Bible that he stood faithful to. And may we have the same attitude. May we have the same attitude. It's the little things. If God is, let me, let me get real with you for a minute. If God is asking you to give up meat eating, if you're heavily convicted that meat eating is not something that you should have in your life, 
you think you may think oh that's nothing that's really not that big of a deal let it go let it go I'm not putting myself up on a pedestal, but, you know, the Lord convicted me when I was 18 years old. I needed to give up flesh foods. And I'm so glad I did. Because I feel like that I would be a, a lot, um, I, I'm, I'm healthier now in my 50s than I ever would be if I had continued to eat meat all these years. Okay? So that's just a little example of the little things. Maybe you have an opportunity to cheat on a test. Oh, you know, it's just a little thing. It's not going to mean that much. But it's going to mean a big thing. Maybe you're in a situation where, you know what, I could beat out my, my coworker and I could get a better position if I do this and do that. Maybe spread a little slander or do, do a little lies. It's just a little thing, you know. No, God won't care. No, it is a big thing. Because that's where we prove our character. That's where we prove our character. Just to give another illustration, I'm sorry, I have to give illustrations from my own workplace, okay? Because yesterday, I don't like doing this, but it was the only time that I had to do it. Because, by the way, when I was here before, I had worked 70 hours, I had worked a lot of hours there at Lowe's. Last week, they actually gave me the whole week off, but they still wrangled me in for a couple of days. But anyway, I had a lot of time off last week that I didn't have to off. One of the things I like to do, because it helps people, but it also helps our finances, and that is to donate plasma, okay? One of the things I don't really care to do, it's not my preference, is donate plasma in the morning before I go to work in the shop. Being an auto technician has not really changed over the years. It can be a very physical job, okay? When you donate plasma, it's kind of, you can end up in a situation where, hey, everything's great. But other times, it's kind of unpredictable because it's kind of like, oh, I feel blah. You know, I just feel like I can't move. But yesterday morning, I had donated plasma. And I had one of those mornings where I was feeling like, somebody please get me out of Granddaddy Low here because I'm feeling groggy. You know, I can't move. You know, I can't move. And I had one of the hardest mornings that I've had in a very long time with trying to do transmission flushes and all kinds of stuff going on. You know what I was tempted to do? No, I was actually, I was already in the midst of the work. And I was tempted to kind of make shortcuts. Oh, they, won't, they won't know it if I do this. Or they won't know it if I do that. Yeah, they, they will know it sooner or later. But, but I actually stayed the course. I said, I prayed. Uh, as I was working, I prayed. I said, Lord... Please help me stay the course so I can finish this job accurately and do it completely as it should be done. And that way the customer can get what they paid for. And the Lord helped me with that. Okay. And that's what I said. I want to mention again what I mentioned last time. The Lord will give you what you need when you need it. The Lord will give you what you need when you need it. Because it wasn't easy for me to stay the course yesterday. But the Lord helped me. The Lord help me. And he can do the same for you. He can do the same for you. I don't know what your temptations are. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know where you're at. But the Lord knows. And the Lord knows what's going to come upon your life. And he knows what you need before you even need it. He says that I will answer them before they even call. Right? So he can do that. So they, this is, uh, watch the little things in your life. And watch your patience. Because when, when the underscoring message that I get from these two temptations is that God's people need to be patient. They need to be patient because we want to, especially in our day and age, when, you know, we got a drive through McDonald's mentality, right? We want to get things done and we want to get them done yesterday, right? Not today and we want to get them done yesterday. When we have that mentality, when we want what we want, when we want it, now we have this uh, little problem with patience, we have this little problem with patience. So watch your patience. You will need it someday, if not today. Okay? You will need it someday, if not today. So, in conclusion, David was brought to prominence because he sought first God in what he did. God chose him, though he was the youngest, most insignificant son. He was chosen because of his love and faithfulness to God in all things. Examine your life today to see if you are the same. 
Examine your life today to see if you're the same. God loves you, and he wants you to li- love him in return. Will you honor him in all that you do? Will you be faithful to his word? Will you be a person after God's own heart? Amen. All right, let's close with the final song here. Um, it is, well, it should be up here. Thank you, Brother Rodney, for that. 614. 614, sound the battle cry. rise. Father in heaven, with Christ as our captain, we cannot fail. We will not fail. I pray, Father, that each one of these that are in my hearing today, my brothers and sisters and you, pray, Father, that they will go forward in their sphere of influence to this week, victorious to gain new ground for you, that we would all be a strong witness to our neighbors, to our friends, to our enemies, to our co-workers, to whoever we come across this week, strangers in the grocery store, whoever it may be, that we be uh, sounding the battle cry, that we would be a strong witness for you, that we would be like David. Sometimes we might have to listen for the blowing of the wind in the mulberry trees, and we have to be patient. But other times, the commission is clear. It says, go, go. In Matthew 28, it says, go. I pray, Father, that we would be uh, roused up, that we'd be mighty like David, that we would be victorious in you and that we would be able to share you with others before it's too late. We don't have much time, Father. Pray that you would help us to get the fire underneath us and get it and get going so that we would be able to help others to know the truth before it's too late. Thank you, Father, for doing this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.